Hi, everybody. Welcome to Texas Native Cats. Mm -hmm. um, I'm proud to introduce Monica Morrison, who has been a Texas master naturalist since 2012. And her background is uh, very interesting. So uh, while working on her master's degree at SMU, she became enamored with the rainforest of the Amazon. After a trip to Brazil and a stay in a jungle treehouse for several days, she was smitten. Knowing that the Amazon was the stronghold for the jaguar and other feline species, she returned to Dallas and vowed to get involved in big cat conservation. Monica started her quest at the Dallas Zoo as a volunteer and tiger docent. Since that time, she has volunteered in various capacities at two Dallas area big cat rescue centers. She participated in an ocelot study in Mexico and another in Kenya on African lions. Totally envious. Uh, she has also worked with organizations in South America on Jaguar and other big cat projects. In 2017, she founded Texas Native Cats, a 501c3 that promotes education, outreach, and advocacy for Texas's five species of wild cats, past and present. Two years ago, she turned her attention to the Texas mountain lion and works with other like-minded individuals to advocate for a change in regulations for our apex predator. She will explain about the great diversity of our felines, their habitats, physical characteristics, and the threats that they face. She will also explain the important role they play in maintaining nature's health and diversity. She will describe the struggles of the cats that us humans influences have brought. And thank you and take it away, Monica. All right, thank you so much, Robin, for that introduction and uh, everybody for joining in tonight. So I have a full hour presentation and I will do my darndest to keep everybody, keep it on schedule here because if you let me, I'll just talk about cats all night and I'm sure you have other things that you'd like to get done tonight besides listen to me talk. So most I'm going to cover all five species of past and current cats that wild cats that we've had in Texas. I will spend most of my time, however, on our mountain lion uh, because our mountain lion in Texas is in trouble. Uh, quite frankly, all of our cats, with the exception of the bobcat, are in trouble. But we'll get to that in a minute. So um, I think I saw a, a notice come up. If you have questions, I guess put them in the chat and we'll get to them at the end here of this presentation. So let me share my screen. All right. So uh, anyhow, some of the photos I have, a couple of these photos are from Ben Masters. I imagine some of you have seen Deep in the Heart. I'll mention it a little bit later on, but if you have not, I highly encourage you to watch that film. There is some uh, sequence in there on our West Texas mountain lions, as well as ocelots, and a whole host of other amazing species in this state, as well as the ecosystems that support them. So if you haven't seen it, you can get it off Google. Um, it's about a two-hour film, highly, highly recommended. So let's get started here. All right, it's not going to work that way. There we go. We'll do it this way. Okay, so I always like to start out my presentations here with some, uh, I guess, brain teasers of sort. And here are the five species of wild native cats that have lived in Texas and some still do. Uh, in the upper left hand corner, the bobcat, below that, the ocelot, and the bottom right, uh, the mountain lion, still called Texas home. The other two, the jaguar and the jaguarundi, are extirpated. So what I like to do is play a short audio clip for you. And I'd like you to tell me two things. First of all, try to identify if you think it's a big cat or one of the small cats making the sound. And if you're really good, you'll tell me which cat it is. Now, I will tell you, you only got four to choose. The I do not, I have not found a suitable recording yet of the Jagarundi, so I don't have that one. But I have the other four. So if everybody's ready, I am going to kick this off. Hopefully this will work. All right, number one. Oh wait, let's let's see. Hope let me know if you can hear this okay. Good. All right. <laughs> 
not a very happy cat. I think we can all at least agree with that. Uh, all right. Anybody want to offer up some, uh, some, some ideas here as far as is that a big cat or a small cat or which cat is it in the chat window? All right, somebody did. Let's see here, I guess. Small, good. Ocelot, mm, no. So if it's not an ocelot and we don't have the jaguarundi, by process of elimination, it has to be the bobcat, right? Yeah, so that is a very unhappy bobcat. And, and you know, understand that these cats, just like every other species on the planet, make all sorts of different vocalizations. These are just some representative ones. Okay, so let's try the next one. Okay, chat window. Let's see, I lost my chat window. Hmm, there it is. All right, anybody have any ideas on what that was? Mountain lion, yay! No mountain lion gets it. Very good, Carolyn and Robin and David. You got it. Yes, mountain lion. Uh, we'll talk about all the different names this cat has here when we get to the mountain lion section. Very good. Okay, let's try the one up at the top. Okay, that one's got to be a giveaway. Jaguar, yes, absolutely, absolutely the Jaguar. Uh, just a question here for you to ponder. Think about what other big cat does that sound like? Anybody know or have a hazard a guess? Think about the big cats you've heard at a zoo. Yes, a lion, absolutely. Uh, it is believed to be most closely related to the tiger. So what does that tell you about the planet at one time? Hmm? Yes. And, and I'll go into a little bit more on that when we get to the Jaguar. All right, one more. And this one, of course, process of elimination, right? Oh, this little bar thing keeps coming up at the bottom and I can't see. How do I get the, the bar at the bottom to go back down? Anybody know? It's hiding my, my, my sound bar. Is there a little arrowhead that you can click on or no? Let's see. Now that's chat. Every, mm, me, me. well, hang on. I, mm, dang. <laughs> click right there. Pause, share, stop, share. Blah, blah, blah. You are screen sharing. You are using enhanced. Dock to top. Oh, let's do that. There we go. Well, that got it out of the way. At least it's the top now. Okay, here we go. Yes, or not. Okay, anybody on that one? Let's see what we got in our chat window. Ocelot, yeah, another unhappy cat, huh? Okay, very good, very good. Um, so there are our cat sounds. Let's uh, let's move to the next one. We're gonna start with bobcats. So bobcats, scientific name is Lynx Rufus. We'll talk about that a little bit more in a minute, that scientific name. Why are they called bobcats? Well, I think we all realize this because of their short bobbed tails. They are closely related, actually, they're in the same family as the lynx, hence the scientific name of lynx rufus, rufus meaning red. Uh, we have one subspecies in Texas, although there are a number of them throughout the United States, and they are highly adaptable, and they seem to do just fine living among us. They don't seem to cause near the controversy usually around people that coyotes do, um, but of course, they are predators, so... We'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. Um, all right, let's go down to the next slide. So bobcat, what do they eat? Small mammals, they can eat rodents, they can eat birds, they can even eat deer. However, that's not too common because of course deer are pretty good sized, but they will kill them. 
their primary diet is deer. I, I'm sorry, is is uh, small mammals like rodents. Uh, they love rats and mice. So if you have any of those around and you see a bobcat on the prowl, don't be upset. Be very happy you have a bobcat around because that will eliminate your your uh, rat or mice problem. They live in a number of places all over Texas, all over the United States. I'll show you a range map in just a moment. And they are pretty much habitat generalists, scientists call them. So they can live, again, just about everywhere, all throughout the country and in Texas. Their range, is, and it varies, the urban bobcats don't have near as much of a range as the uh, rural bobcats do, but it's anywhere between five and 50 miles. If you're interested, by the way, there was an urban wildlife study, uh, bobcat study done in, I think in 2017 by Texas Parks and Wildlife in Arlington. So if you go out and just do a Google search on urban bobcat study in Arlington, you'll find it. It's about 15, 20 minutes, and it gives you the data of what they found on these bobcats. They managed to do just fine living among us, and they've learned to, to use uh, a lot of the infrastructure that we have in place to their own benefit, like sidewalks and fences. In Texas, our bobcats are <clears throat> a bit smaller typically than they are in the West and some other parts of the country, primarily due to habitat here. It's hot, it's dry. A lot of times, in, particularly in certain parts of the straight state, uh, prey species are not as abundant as they are in other places. The males are bigger than the females, and this is true of all of these five wildcat species. The males, actually, I probably should bump that up a bit. It's somewhere usually in the neighborhood of around 30 pounds for a male. Females a bit less, 20, maybe 25 pounds, and they're approximately you know, 35 inches long. Excuse me. So Texas population, uh, according to Texas A&M Kingsville, several years ago was estimated to be about 200,000. Now, I don't know how this number was determined. To my knowledge, there has never been any kind of state bobcat survey. Uh, so I, I'm not sure how that came about, but that's what uh, A&M Kingsville is telling us. The U.S. population is pretty darn robust, 2.4 to 3.6 million. So they are, they are in overall in pretty good condition and shape. So this I like to show a uh, comparison of the bobcat to the next photo of the lynx. So notice this cat, and I will say bobcats have these markings, the spots, the stripes. You notice the tufts of fur on the ears and the ruff around the neck. But this varies somewhat from place to place. I don't believe this cat was probably filmed in Texas. I don't know that. But I have a taxidermy bobcat that I named uh, Terry. And Terry, you can barely see the ear tufts. And Terry really doesn't have any kind of rough. But she's a North Texas girl. So maybe she just didn't like that. Um, so you will see some variation. But look at the size. There's the bobtail and these other characteristics that I described. Now look at the Canada lynx, it's close relative. Similar in appearance, you can see, certainly see the big thick ruff along the neck. Kind of see this one ear tuft right here, the short tail. And look at those feet, would you? Holy mackerel, uh, huge feet on these cats. They use their feet like snowshoes. Obviously that's where it's walking. And you notice that the coat looks a bit different. It's much more subdued in appearance than that of the bobcat. And it's a bigger cat. I think, I think lynx weigh around 40 to 45 pounds in general. So it's a much bigger cat, no, bigger. So comparison to the two. Now, this is another one I like to show people because <clears throat> a lot of people mistake bobcats for mountain lions. And you don't have mountain lions in Houston. And we hardly ever have them in Dallas. So the chances of somebody seeing a mountain lion in either of our cities is pretty slim. Uh, and you'll see here this compare. I like this graphic because you get a real sense of the, the differences between the two. When I look at this image, about all I can say is, yeah, they're both cats. And, and then all similarities kind of dissipate after that. You can see that the mountain lion is a much, much bigger cat. You notice down here, it says it's seven to eight feet total length, whereas the bobcat's all of three feet. And the, the mountain lion is a solid color. 
and notice the black tip on the tail. And it's, it's just a much bigger cat. And then our bobcat, of course, we've already seen the images, the short tail, the ear tufts, the stripes, and the spots. So whenever I get emails to my website and somebody says, I'm pretty sure I saw a mountain lion in Cedar Hill or Arlington or wherever it is. Uh, well, first of all, nobody ever has a photo to show or very seldom. They don't have any evidence other than what they saw. And so I just have to tell them it's highly unlikely. At one point, yes, they did exist throughout the state, but not anymore. So here's a range. <clears throat> and you can see here, it, this cat ranges up into parts of the uh, lower part of Canada. Of course, Canada really is lynx territory, but uh, up into Canada, all the way down about halfway into Mexico, very widespread throughout the country. I have a theory about why they don't exist beyond about central Mexico, and that's all it is. I don't know. It's just a guess, I guess, on my part. And that is, I think there's just too much competition down there. The farther south you go it is really in, in central and then much less into South America is really the stronghold of these cats, um, Bob, not bobcats, but other cats, jaguars, mountain lions, ocelots, margays, and other predators as well. So I just don't think they've, they've got the ability to withstand all that competition. But I should add, I'm going to ask somebody at some point why that, why their range is limited like that. Uh, all right, let's see what do benefits and threats these cats face. So they, like all predators, help to preserve nature's balance. I'll talk a lot more about that with our mountain lion. I already mentioned that they do reduce the rodent population. Uh, frankly, I think all cats do that. I've always had domestic cats and I have never once, and I've lived in this place 34 years now, I've never once seen a mouse or a rat. And I think it's just the presence of my cats because some of my neighbors have. Uh, they eat carrion, although that's not a typical part of their diet, but they're opportunistic. And if they find a good piece of roadkill someplace that looks halfway edible, they'll eat it. Because consider, too, that every time a predator makes a kill, it's putting itself at big risk. It can be injured. It could be killed. And of course, most of the time, most of these attempts that all predators make, at least the cat species, to make a kill end up in failure. It takes sometimes many attempts before they finally do make a kill. So it's a lot of energy to expend as well. Uh, in Texas, our bobcat has no legal protection. It can be hunted and killed at any time with a valid hunting license. They are also subject to predator control practices and wildlife killing contests. I don't know if you're familiar with wildlife killing contests, but just in a nutshell, these are contests, I use the term loosely, where uh, individuals will congregate on someone's property, not in the cities, of course, I mean, these are rural areas of the state, and they'll pay an entrance fee. There are sponsors that usually, at least in Texas, pay some pretty darn good cash prizes, five and six figures sometimes. And uh, at the appointed hour, these people show up with their rifles and then they use very often calling devices to lure in predators. Could be bobcats, coyotes, mountain lions, but not so much in Texas because we don't think we have that many uh, coyotes, foxes, whatever it is. And then they open fire when these animals start coming in and just kill as many as they can. And usually the prize goes to whoever kills the most or the biggest. And they are legal. They are legal in the state of Texas. They are legal throughout most of the country. There is some talk now at a national level of eliminating them on public lands. But of course, as you well know, in Texas, that won't help at all because most of our land is private. So they are legal. I will say that for now. That's, that's uh, an issue for another day. Their pelts, not so much in Texas really, but their pelts from other states, the Western states are still used in the fur trade. Uh, according to the IUCN, the International Union for the Conservation of Nature, which is the worldwide organization that determines the conservation status of different species throughout the world. So you've heard, for instance, tigers are endangered. That is the decision that the IUCN made, and it's, it's a whole bunch of government bodies that agree to it. So the pelts are used in the fur trade primarily now for Russia and China, because that's where the market is. 
but uh, not so much here from our cats because they're just too small and the fur is too short. I did read one time it can take up to 30 bobcat pelts to make a full length coat for uh, out of fur. All that aside, the biggest problem facing these animals as it is, I think wildlife all over the planet is loss of habitat. So all because of course of humans. So bobcats in Allen, Allen is a, a northern burb here outside of Dallas to uh, take a photo here by a friend of mine and fellow volunteer of this cat in her yard one time. I love this cat. He's just got, he, I don't know, male or female, just kind of, you know, sauntering along, checking out the neighborhood, looking up over the fence, just really seems to be at ease. So what to do? You see one. And I imagine, I, I usually ask if it's in person for a show of hands, how many people have seen them in their neighborhoods. But I'm guessing in Houston, like everywhere else, depending on where you live, you do see them because they're very widespread. If you do see one, the best thing to do, of course, is leave it alone. Don't try to touch it. Don't handle it. Do not feed it. Don't feed any wildlife because you're just inviting disaster if you do that. And ultimately, it's usually the wildlife that pays for the, the human problem that created it. Don't panic. They're not going to kill anybody, um, not humans at any rate. They don't attack unless they feel threatened. And this is true of all wildlife. And especially if it's a female with kittens, give mom some room, give her some space because she is not gonna want you around her kittens. Don't allow small pets to roam around outside. That's small dogs and house cats. There was a story here of a fellow that lived in Richardson outside of Dallas, that's a suburb, a couple of years ago. And he had some sort of Yorkie or something. I don't remember what the dog was. And Bobcat jumped over the fence, snatched it, and was gone, just like that. And he couldn't do anything about it. So some time passed, he got another Yorkie or whatever it was. He was outside in the backyard with the dog, and danged if a bobcat didn't hop the fence, grabbed the dog, hopped back over in the wink of an eye. More than likely, it was the same bobcat that did that because he figured, hey, there's free meals around here. Uh, if you see one, well, I say scare it away. If it's bothering you, if you don't want it around you, the best thing you can do is haze it very, you know, uh, conscientiously. Nothing that's bad. I mean, you don't shoot BBs at it or something like that. Make a lot of noise, spray it with water, and do that for a while, and it will move on. If it is a female with kittens, she will move those kittens anyway at some point. They, mom doesn't ever stay in one location for too long. So the problem will, will uh, self-eliminate. And to me, the cool thing is, oh my gosh, you got to see a wild cat in your neighborhood. All right, we're going to move on here to ocelots. Uh, I always say this Leopardus podalis, but that I think is a Latin pronunciation. And anyway, it looks somewhat... Well, sort of, not really, but it has some characteristics that look a little bit similar to the leopard. It, we have the only breeding ocelots in the United States in far south Texas. And by that, I mean the lower Rio Grande Valley, Brown Brownsville, and Harlingen. Uh, there are a few male ocelots from time to time spotted in southern Arizona that come from the state of Sonora in Mexico, but so far no females. Just like the jaguars, there are a few jaguars from time to time that come up from Mexico into Arizona. At any rate, uh, we they are classified as endangered in the United States and have been that way since the Endangered Species Act was created in 1973. Uh, at this point, experts believe there are about 80 of these cats remaining in Texas with about 15 of those uh, about uh, perhaps at the Laguna Atascosa National Wildlife Refuge in far south Texas. The remainder are on private ranches. 95% of their habitat is gone. These cats used to range all the way up to the DFW area. Um, trying to remember how long ago that was. Certainly not, <laughs> not in the last 50 to 75 years, um, but they did. And now they are confined to this very, very small part of far South Texas. Uh, private ranches may hold the key to saving these cats. Uh, I think it goes without saying that 
certainly some ranchers don't view predators favorably. Although if they have endangered species on their property, they are bound by certain requirements to maintain these species and not do any kind of harm to them, which again, isn't always too popular with them. But uh, they're, of course, not all ranchers are that way. I think some of them are excited that they, uh, that they have these cats on their sites, on their property. Urbanization, there's, if any, I'm sure some of you have been down there to the refuge before. I've been down a couple of times and I remember the first time I was there, of course, there's highways down there. Um, there's a lot of agriculture, but what really blew me away were the wind turbines. I had no idea they had those things down there and they're huge, as you know. And if you if you walk around them, they kind of make this weird noise and they have these weird lights that particularly at night, they look downright creepy to me. Um, so there's a lot of that that threatens the cat. But I will say the biggest problem for this cat is car strikes on the highways down there. Uh, and one year, several years ago, they lost eight at the refuge. And when you consider that there are only maybe eight, that's a huge, huge number to deal with. So cars are their worst enemy. However, um, all this aside, of course, there is protection by the federal government. Uh, there is, they've been talking about recovery efforts. So help me, I'm not exaggerating since at least 1998. Is that right? I think so. That was when I was in Mexico on an ocelot research trip for the Dallas Zoo. And they were talking about it then. It has still never occurred. And by that, what, what the proposal is, is to introduce a female ocelot from the state of Tamaulipas in Mexico into South Texas because it's the same subspecies and it would help with the gene pool. But that's never happened. Um, also, there's an attempt at some point, perhaps, I haven't heard about this in some years, um, wildlife corridors connecting the two areas of the refuge that are separated by private property. But the good news is TxDOT and others have built a total of 15 wildlife underpasses down there by the refuge uh, to allow all wildlife some safe passage. And it does seem to be helping. I believe that there were no, uh, no reported killings of at least by car strikes last year at the refuge. So, and here you go. I hope this is clear enough. Uh, camera trap photo. Uh, look at that, an ocelot using one of these underpasses down there at the rain, at the refuge. So these underpasses and, and land bridges seem to be the way to go to help our wildlife. So it's a good thing, and hopefully that will help conserve them. So let's see. Next up is this funky looking little dude, a jaguarundi. Um, it's not related other than the fact it's feline to the jaguar. Um, I have seen one in my life. This was again when I was on the trip with the Dallas Zoo to go and uh, do a study on ocelots where we did capture four ocelots, by the way. And, but the first cat we came upon that we had trapped was, an, was a jaguarundi. And I remember being in a truck and we pulled up in the morning to check our traps and somebody pointed out and said, oh, look, we got a jaguarundi. And I remember asking at the time of what? What is that? Strange looking cat. It goes by the name sometimes of otter cat because it's kind of got that appearance. It's it's a very kind of sleek body and a small head and dark brown. Um, but that's what it was. That's the only one I've ever seen. So they are also endangered. Their habitat did overlap that of ocelots in South Texas. Again, no surprise here, loss of habitat, reason for their decline. Although I will say, I think at least some folks at Parks and Wildlife think that there were never too many in Texas to begin with. Um, this is the very northernmost part of their range, as it is as well, of course, for the ocelots in Texas. Uh, the last one was seen, I need to update that to about 40 years ago now, because I think it was 1984 when the last confirmed sighting of a jaguarundi occurred outside of Brownsville, where one had been struck and killed by a car. Uh, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service has a jaguarundi recovery plan, uh, just as it does for the ocelot. However, nothing's happening with it. The last I heard from, Parks and, I'm from Fish and Wildlife Service, they are uh, focused on the ocelot 
which I guess makes sense. I mean, we have ocelots. Let's focus our attention, our efforts on what we do have rather than what we don't have. Because another thing is they don't want to introduce a competitor to the ocelot. Now the jaguarundi is much is, is smaller anyway. It only weighs maybe 15 to 17 pounds. It's quite small. But again, I understand. Let's focus on what we have. So we'll see if there's ever anything that comes about with the jaguarundi. And that's a baby jaguarundi. One of my volunteers was down in Costa Rica last month at an a animal rescue center and vet clinic. And they had a baby jaguarundi there that was about four months old. And so Chris took this photo and I thought it was just as cute as can be. So that's Chris's photo of his baby. But notice, I don't know if you can see, but you see those little teeth down there, those canines? <laughs> that little bitty baby already has some, some, uh, some pretty good teeth on it. All right, the big guy, jaguars, my very favorite cat in the whole world. Um, <clears throat> these cats are amazing creatures. The scientific name is the Panthera onsa. Panthera is the, uh, the lineage for all the big cats in the world, which I'll show you in a minute here. Um, <clears throat> notice something unique about the jaguar. A lot of people confuse the jaguar with the leopard. And I, I need, I guess I need to put a leopard photo in here and that would really help you out. But two significant difference, well, three actually, the jaguar is a bigger cat than the leopard. It's the third biggest cat in the world. And you notice here it has spots on its body, these circles, and then within those circles is a spot. The leopards also have circles on their bodies, but they don't have those spots inside the spot. So that's one telltale difference. One of the other things is the other thing that is so different from leopards is the size of the head on this cat. Look at this jaw. I mean, it's just massive. Uh, these cats kill their prey the way all other cats kill their prey. They have two primary methods. Either they crush the windpipe or they sever the spinal cord. I've always told people, look, if you're gonna get killed by a wild animal, make it a cat because you're not gonna suffer. You're not gonna be ripped to shreds like, like some animals do. Uh, but this, this jaw that they have, they have such powerful jaws that they will regularly also crush the skull of their prey. And it's the only cat that does that. Out of all the cats we have in the world, it's the only one that can do that. When I was in the Amazon once, uh, I was out in a, in a village, a very remote village on a river, and there was a skull of a caiman, which is part of the, the uh, I guess, alligator and crocodile family. And you could see the eye sockets. And then above the eye sockets were these two holes, which we're pretty sure it was, uh, it was killed by a jaguar. They do a lot of their hunting in, in parts of South America in the rivers. So uh, I already told you this, third biggest cat in the world. The largest cat is the tiger, especially the Siberian tiger. It's the world's biggest cat. Uh, African lion is second, and then jaguars are third. And after that, follow the leopards. Those are the true big cats uh, on our planet. Texas and the U.S. Southwest are the really northernmost part of their range. Uh, there's a few, as I mentioned, from time to time in southern Arizona. They are classified in the U.S. and in Texas and in, and, uh, in the U.S. and Texas as endangered. The last one was killed on the coast back in the 1940s, so what, 80 years ago or so. Unlike uh, other cat species like the bobcat, where you saw there are 12 subspecies throughout the country, uh, jaguars, according to Alan Rabinowitz, who was the uh, foremost expert on jaguars, said there's only one species of jaguars, which is amazing when you think about it. And that, I guess, I, I think have to think has to be because of connectivity, that these cats, the range is not nearly, say, what, what there is for the mountain lion. It's much smaller than that. But that tells me that they have connectivity to one another. And that's why the subspecies have not, have not prevailed. So it is the top predator in the Americas, and again, our only true big cat. And here's a footprint of a jaguar that I took in the Pantanal. Pantanal in English means swamp or wetlands. It's the largest wetlands in the world and the home to amazing wildlife. When I was there in 2018, I saw 10 jaguars in the wild on that trip. 
following year I saw seven and I took this photo. So you can see the four lobes and then here's the heel pad right here. And I would say I should put or something down by it to, to get a sense of proportion, but it's probably about four or five inches in diameter from height and height rather. So that is our Jaguar. Someday I guess I need to make a presentation on Jaguars too, because they're just amazing. I love Jaguars. So uh, that is it in terms of Bobcats, Ocelots, Jaguarundis, and Jaguars. And at this point, unless somebody has some questions, let's see what we got in the chat. Did we ever have Margays? Let's see. Let me roll up to the top here and make sure I get all the questions. We, we answered all those. Uh, you're upsetting my cats. That must have been when I was playing the sounds. How does their habitat, Bobcats, compare with coyotes? I would say their habitat overlaps quite a bit, at least in Texas. Um, bobcats will kill coyotes from time to time. It depends on how many coyotes there are, of course. I think they kind of have a, I don't know, a, a, an overlap and they have learned how to coexist somewhat. So uh, coyotes all over the state and bobcats all over the state too. Uh, bobcat in the roof and copal, yeah, I bet. All right, size and weight compared to a big fat feral cat. Well, bobcat's still going to be a bigger cat unless it's it's you know not a full grown. If it's uh, not an adult yet, it would be. <clears throat> excuse me, um, would be a bit smaller, but. Yeah, it's it's a bigger cat than a big fat feral cat. Let's see. Are bobcats mostly in North Texas? Uh, no, they're all over the state. I mean, I I give these presentations regularly, and particularly in person, I always, as I say, I ask for a show of hands. How many of you have seen bobcats in your neighborhood? And my gosh, at least half or two thirds of the hands go up. So they are very prevalent. Does this mean, I guess, and somebody want to answer this in the chat, you don't see them in Houston? I'd be curious to know if you don't see them down there. Uh, let's see, what else, what else? Uh, countries of Houston, I have one that lives next door. Yeah, good, yeah, yeah. Amazing, okay, what else? Did we ever have margays? Well, that's a controversial topic. I think the verdict at this point is we've had one. One documented case, I believe, in the 1870s, and they have never been seen since. So I think the prevailing wisdom these days is mm, no. If so, we had very, very few, and they were probably all along the border. Let's see. We have anything else? Is that it? I guess that's it. Yes. Okay. So let us move on to our mountain lion. Uh, let's see. I got 22 minutes according to my. 21 minutes. Okay, then I will talk very fast again. So uh, this I, is a slide from um, uh, Sol Ross University Borderlands Research that was doing a, a mountain lion study out in West Texas for 10 years. You can see this cat is collared here. And notice how well it blends in with the background too. Seminole Canyon State Park. This is just evidence of the indigenous people's reverence for cat species. And you see this as well in Mexico and in South America, where they, the native peoples really view these animals as, I don't know if they view them as gods necessarily, but they had a real respect for them. So here is this cave painting down at Seminole Canyon. And I believe it's several, it's several thousand years old. All right. So trivia time. Okay. How many species of exotic wild cats exist in the world? And this is all exotic cats, not just the big ones. I will give you a hint. It's between 25 and 50. So if anybody wants to hazard a guess in the chat window, go for it. Okay, we've got one intrepid soul. 45, uh, 37, much, yeah, much closer to the, to the reality. The um, 42 is a bit high. So I will say there's some variance in this. I would say it's anywhere between 36 and 40. And a lot of that different, I think the differentiation is due to some subspecies classification that some people consider as, as an additional species and other people don't. And I'm saying these are the, the researchers, the scientists. I usually go with 36, but, and the vast majority of those are very small. 
species of cats that you've probably not heard of in most cases. Uh, the Andean cat, the fishing cat, the palace cat, the marble-headed cat, it just goes on and on and on. Not a lot is known about many of these, <clears throat> excuse me, small cats. Some of them are endangered. Some of them can be melanistic or black, just like, by the way, jaguars and leopards can also be black, but there is no such thing as a black mountain lion, black panther. Um, so in our mountain lion, you see some of the different names it has there, and you'll you'll understand more of that why it has so many names in a minute. Uh, many many names. I this at least among cat species, this cat has more names than any other, and that's why it gets confusing because unless you know the different names, you sometimes don't realize are we talking about the same cat or something different. So typically, I will say the three names that you will hear will be cougar, mountain lion, or puma. And I'll show you that, well, all right, below there, you see the derivation of these names. Two of them come from indigenous people in South America. <clears throat> and then the Spanish showed up and believe it or not, they thought they were seeing African lions, hence the name mountain lions. So that's where that comes from. Most researchers in the Western part of the country refer to them as mountain lions, but you do hear the word cougar a fair amount too. So let's take a look at the lineage of this cat. And I know there's a lot of information on this little screen here, but I'm pointing out just a couple of things here that I want you to see. At the bottom, you see the Panthera lineage. Again, those are the true big cats of the world, lions, jaguars, tigers, and then the different leopard species. Um, and those cats have been on the planet for about 10 million years. And then you see other lineages that, that uh, came after those. And then you see our puma lineage here. So again, mountain lion or cougar or puma. You see the puma is listed, the jaguarundi, that funny looking little guy. And then how about the cheetah? Hey, wait a minute, how does the cheetah get in there? Um, well, again, just consider what the planet looked like at one time when it was supposedly all one big land mass or species crossed continents from the Bering Land Bridge. So that is what you see there. And you see the Puma lineage has been around for about 7 million years and then other cats uh, after that. Interesting uh, to see all of the different cat species here and how long they've been around. So here is the current and historic range of the mountain lion. The brown represents the historical range. And you can see our mountain lion lived all throughout the entire United States. When the Europeans came here, they were everywhere. And so were bears and so were wolves and a host of other species. And then you see the red, which represents the current range. And these cats now are largely, although not exclusively anymore, confined to the West. And they range from the Yukon up in um, Canada all the way down to the tip of South America in the Andes. They are the most widely spread terrestrial mammal in this hemisphere outside of humans. They exist in 28 different countries. Um, so very, very, uh, very, very versatile cat. Uh, all right, so this is a bit of a dated range map here. Uh, not range map, but, but uh, expansion map. This organization that I got this from doesn't seem to be around anymore. So, and I haven't found anything that replaces it. However, it does give you an idea of how these cats are spreading. You notice again, their stronghold was in the West. The reason for that being, again, when the Europeans settled here, the, they certainly came with the attitude of the only good predator is a dead one. They were concerned about the loss of their livestock their own personal safety, and that of the loss of their prey species as well that they wanted to eat. So what did they do? They wiped them out. So that's why to this day, you still, other than this remnant population down here in far south Florida, which is the Florida panther, also a mountain lion, you don't find mountain lions on the east coast. And until fairly recently, you didn't really even find them in the central part of the country. Uh, but they are spreading east back to their historical habitat. And a reason for that is twofold. One, they're following their prey species, which again is primarily deer, white-tailed deer or mule deer. Uh, and these blue dots and red dots are differences in 
confirmed sightings, but they are confirmed sightings. And so all of a sudden now you're finding that these cats are moving east. So for instance, the Dakotas now both have relatively small mountain lion populations, but they exist. And then um, Nebraska has a mountain lion population. I always forget this one's Nebraska and that one's Kansas, or maybe it's the other way around, but well, whatever. Anyway, I get my geography mixed up. So they are, there's a very small population in Nebraska. Uh, Oklahoma has some mountain lions, but not what's considered a resident population. So, but what's, what's interesting is I say they're moving east. So within just like the last six months, literally, mountain lion sightings, confirmed sightings have been found, have been had in Illinois, Missouri, and Iowa. And in, uh, they've almost always been males. However, the sighting of the one in Iowa was of a female. So you know what that means. At some point, there's going to be some breeding going on. And one of the experts believes it's just a matter of time before mountain lions begin to establish territories in parts of the east where they used to live. Um, it's going to be very interesting to watch how that rolls out and what people's perceptions are about having a large predator in their midst again. So they are the second biggest cat in the Americas behind a jaguar. And notice here there are six subspecies, unlike our jaguar that has only one. They are classified again as least concern because they're very abundant, with the exception of the Florida panther, which is endangered. So I said there's no such thing as a black panther. Uh, males are bigger than the females, and the males in Texas tend to be on the, the shorter end of the range here. 110, maybe up to 150 is about normal. The females are usually smaller than that. They're fantastic at jumping and leaping, a lot of that due to that very long tail they have that helps them with balance. And in, long, they're cap in captivity, they can live approximately 20 years assuming, of course, they get good care. In the wild, maybe about half that, maybe 12 to 15, depends. Um, it's a rough life being a predator. Habitat, well, you can imagine by looking at that range map I showed you a minute ago, these cats can live just about anywhere. They're now even being found swimming to from different islands outside the state of Washington in the ocean. Like, okay, so they are just, they are just incredible cats uh, and how well they tolerate different types of habitats. Uh, again, primary habit or diet is deer, uh, javelina, elk. They will eat feral hogs now. Um, and I know you've got those down there because we all have feral hogs in this state. Uh, these animals are just uh, notoriously destructive as we know. Um, it's not a huge part of their diet, but they have been shown to kill feral hogs. Oops. The male's range is much bigger than the females, it can be 700 miles or more. By the way, there's a good, very, very short film on West Texas mountain lions called The Lions of West Texas. You can do a Google search on it, or you can go out to our website, texasnativecats.org, and it's there. It is an overview of the one of the studies that was done in the Davis Mountains and the uh, kill sites that existed from mountain lions. And they found um, all sorts of things that these, they'll eat all kinds of critters, uh, but these are their primary diets. Females range is much smaller. They very often, the range of the females overlaps that of their mothers. Uh, the boys, however, don't get along so well. And so by the time these cats are about a year, maybe 18 months, mom's had enough of them. And so she leaves them so they can go off and figure out the universe on their own. The males, however, usually are the ones that have to, uh, uh, to, to disperse and very often go long distances because uh, an established tomcat, a mountain lion tomcat will not, will not, um, would not allow another mountain lion in its territory. And if they can, they'll kill them. So these mountain lions are forced to move out uh, and establish bigger territories of their own. Uh, this was back in 1922, this lovely photo here of what, what used to happen uh, with mountain lions. 
they were treated as vermin. There are still those, I will say, in this state and other states, in my opinion, that still view them as vermin. Uh, in some ways, we haven't progressed a whole, a whole lot farther than this, at least in the state of Texas, in regard to our mountain lions. In Texas, our mountain lion has no protection, just like the bobcat. It is a non-game species, which means there's no hunting limit. <clears throat> there is no limit on trapping. We are now only one of two states. It used to be we were the only state. Sadly, last month, Utah changed its laws and now allows trapping and hunting year round with no limits. So they are uh, essentially in most ways, just like we are. Uh, Texas Parks and Wildlife, however, looks at this cat and, and believes it to be, um, a, it classifies it as, an, as imperiled or threatened. And uh, as master naturalist, perhaps you've heard of the species of greatest conservation need in the TCAP. If not, you may want to take a look at that at some point. We've got 1,300 species on that list in Texas. And, and four out of our five cats are listed in there as having some level of concern. The only one that doesn't is the bobcat. Uh, we have no state management, uh, mountain lion management plan either. And we allow trapping. Uh, without any regard for checking the traps. There's no stipulation that traps have to be checked at any particular or at any interval at all. So whatever gets trapped usually is left there to die. Uh, we have two distinct populations in Texas, the Trans-Pecos, which of course is out here, El Paso down through Big Bend, and then flying around Val Verde County, which I think is somewhere around in here. Uh, that's usually considered the, the differentiation between West and South Texas. That is thought to be the stronghold of our mountain lions in Texas. Although there is quite a lot of scientific data that shows that there is immigration of cats from New Mexico in Mexico into West Texas, which is good because trapping is very widespread in West Texas uh, of these cats. So it's good that, that we've got the influx coming in. Um, otherwise they would, uh, I'm sure they would be disappearing the way the South Texas population is, which is believed to be in a very fragmented habitat. Uh, there's not any connectivity between the two populations. And even Parks and Wildlife is concerned that the South Texas population may be suffering from inbreeding, uh, not unlike its cousins in South Florida in, called the Florida Panther where that existed several years ago, which by the way was overcome by importing five female mountain lions from Big Bend and taken to Florida to help even out the, uh, to breed with the cats there and even out their genetic problems. So um, those are two populations. Here are a couple of traps that are fairly typical. This one is called a pan tension trap animal steps on this plate here and the jaws snap shut and the animal cannot get out. And then here's a snare trap. These are used, uh, well, this is actually Brewster County out in West Texas, but I understand these are fairly common in South Texas as well. Again, you can see the animal was just left. Uh, Borderlands Research out in West Texas in Alpine uh, has completed a couple of studies out there in the Davis Mountains and also Big Bend National Park uh, the cats that they studied there, and this, if you if you watch that uh, film that I mentioned to you on our website, the Lions of West Texas talks about this. The cats that they that they collared and surveyed uh, only had a fifty four percent survival rate, which compared to other states, cats is is low. It's quite low. Uh, they saw and found no livestock depredation at all in the kill sites, and Big Bend National Park was the other one, another ten year study. And <clears throat> the cats are older there because there's not hunting that's allowed. Um, and they were there looking at um, primarily at coexistence between humans and the, the mountain lions. So just a few photos here from Borderlands Research Institute. I like this photo. This cat looks healthy, well-fed, uh, don't see any kind of scars or wounds or anything like that on it. Notice over here, there's a camera. So there would have been one on the other side too. So uh, good photo. 
Here's another one of a cat in Fort Davis up in, around all the boulders. Cat just really is a good camouflage color there. Mountain lion uh, paw. Uh, you can see the four lobes again in the heel pad. Good sized, but not nearly, not as big as those jaguars in South America that I showed you the paw print of. Those cats down there are jaguars can get up to 300 pounds there. Canine tooth. Okay, it's trivia time again. One more trivia question here. Which cat has the longest canines in the world? And I'll give you a hint, it is not in this hemisphere. Let's see if anybody wants to answer that one. Tigers, tigers. Mm -hmm. Nope, nope, it's not a tiger. Nope, nope, not a lion. It's a small cat. It's a small cat in Southeast Asia. Okay, everybody stopped. Okay, what is it, Monica? Nope, not the palace or the snow. Nope, nope, it's the clouded leopard. It's a small cat with very unique markings on its pelt. Uh, but yes, those cats have the longest canines and are thought to be, by some, at least the most closely related to the, uh, the uh, we call them, saber-toothed cats. All right, and then my old stomping grounds, El Paso has mountain lions up in the mountains that bisect the city. And here's one of a cat getting a drink at a spring up there outside the city. And here's one as a kitten. A, when they uh, when they get to be about, I think, was it six months or so, the spots begin to fade and the blue eyes begin to turn kind of an amber color. But And they chirp when they're little. They just sound like little birds. They're really cute. All right, back to what we've got right now. So these are confirmed sightings. This is a database that Texas Parks and Wildlife maintains. It's real time. And uh, you can see here that the stronghold of our cats in Texas is in West Texas. Look here along the border, Brewster and um, uh, Jeff Davis counties. Just a lot of cats out there. A few out here in Hudspeth. And then you start going south and it declines. See a few around Dallas area. That was probably of the mountain lion that was shot to death by a hunter in December of 2020, I believe it was now. Uh, let's see, Houston, well, there's one not too far from you, a few in the panhandle. A lot of these could have been the same cat, too, and probably were. All right, how do we stack up against other states? Well, not too well. Uh, I'm not going to go through all this with you, but essentially what this is demonstrating is that most states that have a resident mountain lion population classify them as game species, so they can be hunted, but there are limits and there are seasons for them. They don't allow trapping, with the exception, as I mentioned, of Utah, which does now. Um, many of them have protections for females with kittens. Every state that has mountain lions has to provide what are called harvest reports. So if a hunter goes in, and kills a mountain lion, he has to report it. He or she has to report it within a very specific time frame to the game agency. Uh, you don't have to do that in Texas. There is no mandatory harvest reporting in Texas. It's all voluntary. I, and one of the reasons for the harvest reporting is to keep tabs on the population so that when the quota is met in a particular area where there are mountain lions in these other states, then the game authorities come in and say, okay, we're closing that particular area for hunting this year. Well, you've met the quota, no more. Uh, and then trapping, as I already mentioned. So we, we were in a league unto ourselves and now it looks unfortunately like Utah, Utah has joined us. And I don't know if there's gonna be any change to that or not. I mean, as I say, it was just, it just happened last month. So why do we want to conserve mountain lions and, and other predators? Well, our mountain lion, of course, is a, is a top, it's an apex predator, top of the food chain. All predators help to maintain diversity of ecosystems and maintaining the lower species. I've got a good, very simple, simplistic graphic that I'll show you in just a second that really demonstrates that, what the scientists call a top-down regulator approach to other species. They may prefer to eat diseased prey. Um, and this one with about the deer with chronic wasting disease is a big deal because I don't, 
I don't know, you may be aware of this, but um, chronic wasting disease is somewhat like mad cow disease, highly contagious to deer species, uh, devastating disease, it will ultimately kill them, but it weakens them terribly. So the mountain lions, of course, being opportunistic, if they find one, they'll kill it and eat it. And it's now been proven that they do not develop the disease themselves. So they're doing a real service to all by taking out these poor deer with a chronic wasting disease. And we have it now in Texas. And it's all it's been found in some wild herds as well as in captive deer that are being bred. Uh, feral hogs, I mentioned, they will kill um, these feral hogs, which now it, I just saw a few days ago, it has gone from 52 million in damages to over 100 million in damages to this state every year by, from this invasive species. These cats have relationships with over almost 500 different species, and they provide more than 3 million pounds of meat daily for other species. And that's range-wide, I don't mean that's in Texas. Um, so they, they provide all kinds of benefits that we're some ways just beginning to realize. And let's face it, they're icons. They're part of our Western heritage. So here is this graphic that I mentioned to you. This is a top-down regulator. Here's the mountain lion or cougar that controls the deer numbers so they don't go in and eat all the vegetation, which in turn allows for other species to live in the vegetation and, and profit from it all the way down to the ground animals. So very much we need our predators. Efforts to help lions, there have been, uh, prior to right now, there have been two efforts in the past, in the 90s, and then again in 2010. Uh, there were a number of people that came together on both sides in both instances, and uh, they were trying to make some, some people were trying to make some change for the mountain lions to get some sort of protections for them, and both efforts failed. Um, I will say that there are just some people in the state that have what I would say are entrenched attitudes and don't want to change the status quo. So uh, our cat so far still has no, no, um, no help. However, Texas Native Cats uh, is part of a coalition group called Texas for Mountain Lions. That's the website address. Uh, if you're interested, highly recommend you go out there and take a look at what we are talking about trying to accomplish in this state for our cat. Six different petition points that we submitted there to Texas Parks and Wildlife last June. Uh, frankly, in my opinion, they're all just kind of common sense. The one thing that would really benefit the cats, if it ever, if it, if this actually ever comes to pass, uh, is management plans. Management plans by the agency, by Parks and Wildlife, would mean that they're going to have to develop something like hunting limits and so forth in the various parts of the state, and hopefully ban or at least manage the trapping. Uh, the the agency, Parks and Wildlife, did uh, turn down our petition. However, <clears throat> last August, about twenty of us. A lot of us, most of us actually from the Dallas area, uh, went to Austin, Texas for the Texas Parks and Wildlife Commission's open meeting every year. The commission is the uh, regulator of Texas Parks and Wildlife, an independent body from the agency. And so we got up there and talked about our mountain lion, as did one of the uh, mammologists from Parks and Wildlife. And at the end of it all, the chair of the commission, uh, Mr. Mr. Applin, who owns all the buckies all over Texas and everywhere else, or CEO of it, instructed Texas Parks and Wildlife to convene a stakeholder advisory group as soon as possible to start talking about these petition points. So those meetings are taking place currently. We will see what may come out of all of this. Um, I've just, I guess I've got a wait and see attitude. There's been as I said, at least two prior attempts to do something and it always falls flat, but we shall see. Uh, our goal is to, in, to encourage the creation of a science-based management plan for our mountain lions, which does not exist.
So last year, uh, or actually year before, uh, Texas Native Cats partnered with Texas A&M to launch an attitude survey about people's uh, thoughts about our mountain lions in the state. It was a very lengthy survey. It included a cross-section of different stakeholders throughout the state. You can see the listing here. Three things among several that were key that came out of this is, yeah, people think, and this is across the board, was not just the urban dwellers, that yes, efforts should be made to make sure these cats survive, that yeah, we could use some more scientific studies because there's never been a statewide uh, scientific study of these cats. And they are an essential part of nature. And that also, if you wanna read the whole thing, if you go out to Texans for Mountain Lions, I, there on that homepage there, you can scroll down and there is a link to it. It's pretty interesting information. So what are the threats to our Texas mountain lions? Well, I think by now you have a pretty good idea. They have no protection. There's no limit on hunting or trapping. There's retaliatory killing, predator control programs, fragmentation of habitat, uh, you name it. And these cats, I think, face it. Threats to humans, really very few. Uh, I don't believe, and I'm not positive this, but I don't believe there's ever been anybody in Texas that's been killed by a mountain lion, certainly not in anything in recent history. Uh, you're more likely to be killed by a pack of, of wild dogs or, or uh, feral dogs or struck by lightning than you are being killed by a mountain lion. Uh, what do you do if you encounter a mountain lion? Well, the first thing you need to try to do is to stay calm, keep your wits about you, Pick up your children and your pets, make everybody gather into one big group, make yourself look bigger. Don't stoop, don't roll around, don't get down on the ground, don't do anything like that. Uh, talk loudly, throw sticks, start backing up slowly. Whatever you do, do not run because that will trigger the predator prey instinct in these animals. And believe me, you can't keep up with them because they run about 30 miles an hour. If you are attacked, fight back. Don't, don't play dead. Uh, you want to fight back with everything you have because people do, for the most part, survive mountain lion attacks. Threats to livestock, coyotes and domestic dogs do more damage to livestock than mountain lions do. You can see there, there's some amount of sheep and loss, uh, sheep and goat loss due to mountain lions, but not as much as, as the coyotes and dogs. Different things that can be done to protect livestock from lions. All of these things that you see here. Um, electric fences, those have been shown in some trial studies down in Brazil to be very effective, at least against jaguars. And jaguars are a more formidable cat than mountain lions are. Um, one of the things, the financial compensation was one of the questions in the survey and surprisingly, that one got some fair, fairly good, favorable response. I was kind of surprised to see that, but, but they did. Uh, this one I thought was really good, maintain the toms. So I heard several years ago, I was at a mountain lion workshop and there was a rancher there who had property in uh, Colorado and Wyoming. And he said, yeah, he had some problems sometimes with mountain lions, with them killing his livestock. He said, but he's speaking to the audience, which were mostly a bunch of wildlife uh, uh, biologists. And he said, you need to maintain the toms. He said, the young subadult males, the teenagers, as I call them, are the ones that are causing the depredation problems to your livestock, not the toms. He said, the toms eat their typical prey, deer, whatever it happens to be. The subadults, are still trying to figure out their hunting skills. So they will go after the easy prey. He said, maintain the toms and they will police these subadults. Uh, just an image here. This was when I was in Kenya on a research trip some years ago. And these people there have lots of predators, as you well know, in Africa. And they just construct these portable enclosures where they put their livestock at night and they cram them in there. They're so tightly packed that if a predator happened to get in there, it'd get trampled to death. They're very effective and simple and they work. Livestock guard dogs, uh, specific breeds that have been used in, in parts of Europe and other areas uh, in, the, in Asia to protect against wolves. And these are dogs that are bred for that particular purpose. 
we do have some that are in use in Texas, I understand. So with this, I think I'm almost at the end here. Uh, I like this quote because I've been saying this for a long time. Science is absolutely necessary. We have to have the science behind us to understand the situation, to understand what we need to know about these animals, whether it's, it's cats or any other species. But science alone is not going to win any kind of, make any kind of overall change. It's got to come from the public. Public has to be aware of the situations and then want to push for a change. Um, if you want to know more, as I said, I already mentioned Texans for Mountain Lions and my own website, Texas Native Cats. Deep in the heart, highly recommend it. It is suitable for kids. Anybody has kids or grandkids, it's fine. Uh, educate yourself about the issues. <coughs> Excuse me. One of the, and I didn't mention this earlier, but one of the websites that's very good if you want to know more about any cat species on the planet is Panthera, P-A-N-T-H-E-R-A dot org. Uh, it is the only organization that is dedicated to all wild cat species throughout the world. Uh, you can sign up for a newsletter. If you, it's electronic, go out to our website and there's a sign up. You can follow us on Facebook and Instagram. Uh, we are always looking for people in other parts of the state to speak up for our cats. Uh, we've got, I don't know if Nicole, is Nicole Cloutier a member of your uh, group or not? I can't remember. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Well, Nicole is dynamite. I, I don't know if she's on the, the call tonight or not, but. Uh, she is. She is. All right. Nicole, kudos to you, girl. You are amazing. You're my poster child for volunteers. <laughs> she just picked it up and ran with it and continues to do so today. So uh, we need more people. We've got potentially another one in, in Waco, uh, another one potentially in El Paso. So we need to get the word out. People need to be educated regardless of the topic, because if they're not educated, they're never going to be able to do anything because they're unaware. Um, we are also planning a statewide education program uh, in schools, so that is well underway. And with that, I'm finished. We do have some questions. All right, let's see. The first one is Deb Baldez. Okay. Is okay. Good question. Is there a problem now with wildcats being kept as pets? Well. Somewhat, I will say one of the good good pieces of information uh, all over the country last year, the Big Cat Public Safety Act became law. You may have heard no doubt of Joe Exotic and his his travesty of horrors in Oklahoma, where he had tigers and all sorts of captive cats that he would use to entertain people and made a lot of money off them anyway. That story uh, was turned into a movie and highlighted all the, the horrific things that can be done to these animals. And so that, and just the fact that they're dangerous animals. So Congress signed uh, or voted to outlaw the ownership of exotic big cats. So truly the big cats uh, throughout the entire country. It was signed into law last year. Uh, people that have these big cats right now will be able to grandfather them in. They have to be registered. People cannot go and acquire other big cats. Uh, if they do, then they're subject to, I think it's a $25,000 fine per instance. So finally, there's some teeth in this and hopefully over time, I mean, it'll take time for this to filter through, but this is a huge when for the big cats. Now it doesn't apply, it applies to of course the ones they mentioned. Mountain lions are included, uh, tigers, lions, all the leopard species, um, I guess that's it. So bobcats, servals, um, ocelot, well you can't keep ocelots anyway, they're an endangered species, but those are not part of this law. So are there some people that still try to have these, these animals as pets? No doubt. Uh, I can tell you after having volunteered at two big cat rescue centers in the area, um, wild cats don't make good pets. They're, uh, they just don't, they're wild. So long answer, but yes, probably there are still some people that have uh, wild cats as pets. 
Let's see, what else do we have? If you see a lion, should you report it? If so, to, yep, you report it to Texas Parks and Wildlife. If you can get a good clear photo, I would also suggest that if you, if you can take a photo that you get something in your photo that gives a sense of proportion. So what happens very often when somebody reports or, or posts on Facebook, whatever it is, hey, I saw a mountain lion or whatever it is, and you see an animal out in a field and you think, well, it kind of has an appearance of a mountain lion, but there's nothing that really tells you how big is this animal? And so what happens, what most of the time what it is, it's a house cat or it's a dog or something like that is not a mountain lion. But if you think you've got a real one or you've got evidence like a, a paw print or scat, yes, by all means report it. And it'll go into that, that database of that uh, image that I showed you a while ago. Uh, let's see, would TPWD have authority to enforce management? Yeah. If, if it comes, if there's a management plan ever determined, yes, absolutely they would. That's who would enforce it, or the game wardens actually would be the ones that would enforce it. Game wardens are, uh, they got a lot of leeway in what they can do. Uh, my grandchildren had a mountain lion as a little league baseball game in George West. Hmm. All right. Is the, I, I'm curious if they, the mountain lion is still alive. Um, I think it's what Louisiana State or Louisiana something in uh, Shreveport has a tiger as its mascot. Well, what I think the University of Houston had one too, Mount Lion. Uh, let's see, Nicole, glad to help. <laughs> um, let's see, many, 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 many great idea. Well done. Okay, I think that's it. I don't see any more questions unless somebody wants to raise a hand or. No speak up that's all i have monica excellent we so enjoyed your presentation and i think we all have uh, our work cut out to try to help these poor cats yeah we we uh you know when i i came back from bolivia some years ago 10 years or so ago trying to help a guy down there establish a wildlife rescue center and it just I just finally realized I could not really help him. I mean, I didn't know the the, the culture. I didn't know the politics and you know, all this stuff. And I was kind of discouraged thinking, well, but I want to help cats. What can I do? And literally I was coming home from the airport on that trip. And all of a sudden it was one of those aha moments in life. And I realized, Monica, the cats right here in Texas need help. And that I feel like I can do something about. And that's what we're trying to do. So. Uh, by the way, uh, I've been in touch with Ben Jones at the Houston Zoo. I've known Ben for a number of years. He was at Dallas Zoo for a long time and just a huge mountain lion supporter. And I know you've got mountain lions there at the Houston Zoo. So at some point we are talking probably this fall, maybe trying to do some sort of event. And I think you have ocelots too, don't you? Does anybody know? I know we have do. tigers and... But I don't know about the Oslo. I, I, I haven't been I, in a while, though. Okay, I thought I remembered reading that. Anyway, we're going to try to do some joint events. So if that's the case, then I will, uh, I'll be down there. Uh, and if anybody, you know, and I'll work through Nicole probably to publicize this. And uh, hopefully we can get a good turnout out there and get people, the zoo visitors, anybody else from your organization that wants to come out and, and get people, get people knowledgeable about our cats. We need, we need to help them while we still can, while we still have these animals, not just the mountain lions, but the ocelots, and to some extent, even the bobcats. Yeah. 